Buenas Zinha for day. On this episode of Buenas Talk, we have Isagundo Megalohan Guahan, Lieutenant Governor of Guam, Josh Tenorio. Thank you so much for the time. We're just going to get right into it, LT. Uh, first of all, how is Governor Lulian Guerrero doing? Governor is doing well. Uh, she is uh, recovering quite well, uh, finishing uh, her uh, treatments as the doctor prescribed, and I expect her to be out in the community real soon. Well, I know you've been very, very busy. You just came back from a trip uh, uh, late May, and I kind of want to get an update uh, on how we can uh, let the community know here in Guam of your efforts. Uh, we'll start with the Veterans Affairs leadership in, uh, in Hawaii. You met with uh, Dr. Adam Robinson. He's the director of the VA Pacific Islands Healthcare System. And if you can get, give us an update on how that meeting went. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the engagement with uh, Veterans Affairs uh, continues. Uh, so I had a few virtual engagements with Dr. Robinson, who is a retired admiral in the United States Navy and the retired Navy surgeon. Uh, general. So he is a medical professional. He has been um, at his post. Uh, he took his post uh, during the pandemic uh, and uh, has not been to Guam yet. He will be coming in uh, the next few weeks to a month, I would say, those um, uh, finalizing those details. Uh, but we've um, the purpose of our engagement is to try and make progress on some of these longstanding deficiencies in um, and needs for improvement uh, for the responsiveness uh, in veterans health care. And uh, some of the the, uh, the routine things that veterans go through on Guam um, are things that I'm trying to get resolved. Those things include um, a lot of decision making on uh, on claims being done elsewhere. Uh, you know, the the uh, delay in getting appointments and services. Uh, and of course, in the bigger scheme, uh, there's continues to be a struggle for veterans trying to increase the level of uh, benefits that they get based on, um, you know, some of the things that they endured during uh, their time in service, especially those combat veterans. So, um, uh, looking at the at the um, the issue, uh, one of the things that the Veterans Affairs Office has done in the last uh, few months. Uh, has been, um, and I'm speaking about the Hawaii group, has been expanding the number of folks that are at the uh, Veterans Outpatient Clinic here and uh, making some improvements to a very frustrating um, uh, telephone system, I guess they would say. Uh, so they they have folks on Guam now hired to answer the, uh, the 800 or 900 numbers, the uh, veterans numbers that they're called, uh, that they call, uh, that veterans call, uh, and to try and get answers uh, faster. And I'll tell you that it still is not in the place uh, that we would like to see, nor uh, is it probably in the place that the Veterans Office believes it should be. Everybody realizes, uh, I think, uh, the message has been heard that there is a call and, uh, and a need to increase the responsiveness uh, you know, and, and and the other thing is the availability of appointments. I have uh, met combat veterans who've had to go to Hawaii for a 30 minute appointment. You know, everything from an EKG or a simple heart um, uh, appointment when uh, there are providers here locally that can do it. I've had a veteran that had to go for knee replacement. And we know that you can get knee replacements in some clinics here and, and delving into these matters uh, trying to understand the flow, the volume. Uh, it really points to um, a solution that we're proposing that uh, I believe that we'll be able to enter into a great partnership uh, with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and that's establishing a veterans uh, clinic on the medical campus. Um, many states, in fact, nearly every state, uh, it, it, it's likely that every state has a state-sponsored um, veterans clinic that uh, is able to provide services and fill in the gaps um, that exist because of the availability elsewhere of uh, direct VA providers. And the concept that the governor asked me to share with, uh, with um, the folks in Hawaii is that the governor of Guam is going to go in, uh, construct this veterans clinic on the medical campus. Uh, we will have space for 
uh, federal VA um, medical personnel to be stationed, but we will uh, hire locally trained physicians, local medical uh, professionals to be able to provide the direct service. And there are, um, there, there are different models that we can work on uh, to try and um, and make sure that the uh, veterans clinic is sustainable, I'm very confident that uh, we're going to be able to get that done. Uh, and it, uh, and uh, establishing the veterans clinic is warmly welcomed, um, and uh, and um, and we've agreed that this is going to elevate um, the responsiveness and availability of veterans healthcare services. In a few weeks, um, I'll be meeting with um, with some officials. Um, uh, within the Hawaii office and further examining uh, options to immediately um, or put in a fast track to gain access to beds that will be required for veterans care, long-term care. Uh, it could be uh, uh, veterans that require personal care uh, and doing that in a central place that uh, we can push resources. And I think that we'll be able to come up with a, a solution in the greater scheme uh, we also talked about um, the hospital and how um, the access to the new hospital, along with our current provider at uh, the private provider at GRMC, um, is going to be necessary to meet the demand for veterans care. Um, the Navy Hospital is insufficient, although there should be opportunity to expand the capacity of Navy Hospital uh, in order to also meet the demands. One uh, thing I also want to mention is uh, there's a significant interest in the Indo-Pacific region, of course, by our national government. Um, because there's going to be um, expanded military resources here on top of expanded attention and a desire by the United States to serve veterans uh, who are living in the freely associated states, um, there are a lot more opportunities, I think, available to us to activate now than there were even two years ago. I've heard you uh, speak on the fact that our veterans deserve to live wherever they so choose. If they want to live here at home, they should do so, and then we should be providing, or the partnership between you and the Veterans Affairs in Hawaii and DOD should be partnering together to provide these services here rather than them go live in Hawaii. Right. And uh, uh, one way we can do that is enabling uh, and improving access to private providers here in Guam. So um, right now, uh, private provide veterans uh, and uh, service members, uh, retirees, if they are eligible and most should be eligible for TriCare or TriWest, uh, which is a third party provider of and uh, uh, administrator of veterans health care, um, there's a, it see, there seems to be a gap uh, and a need for us to work with Veterans Affairs to examine the reasons why uh, not more providers are willing to accept um, that form of coverage. Uh, and uh, it could be that um, the system is so broad and wide um, that we just need to sponsor, uh, which we are have offered to do, and I think we will do, um, a forum in which the private sector medical providers will be able to um, discuss uh, and uh, find out ways in which we can incentivize them to provide on-island medical care in the private clinics uh, on behalf of uh, veterans health care. And that's another thing that we'll be working on um, that is part of the part of the um, solution. It's not just uh, it's a it's a system wide effort that will include the construction of, and operation of the VA clinic, um, expanded access to local private care providers and giving us a pathway to bring specialty care to the veterans here without having to fly them to Hawaii or elsewhere. Right. And with the ongoing situation in the Indo-Pacific and, and the talks with uh, the, the Department of Defense, the hospital that Governor, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero is talking about, uh, whether it be at Eagles Field or not, is still on the table. Uh, it's it, it yes, it has to be on the table. Re uh, remember that um, the time uh, period that we have at Guam Memorial Hospital to remain in that facility um, is you know not more than five to seven years. Uh, there, there, which is about the amount of time that we need to be able to make uh, to open 
um, all aspects of the health center. Let me just say that uh, I expect that at the medical um, uh, complex, uh, the first thing that will be built uh, will be the public health laboratory, which is a $40 million project um, sponsored by and paid for by the Department of Defense. And this public health lab is going to give our island and our region the opportunity to identify and respond faster to threats such as COVID-19, you know, without having to send samples or to get uh, support in Hawaii or Atlanta in order to identify and respond to public health threats. So that will be the first thing that um, gets constructed along with the site preparation and the infrastructure necessary to support a very good, um, vibrant healthcare complex. The healthcare complex with its components uh, for public health, for veterans, for the hospital uh, and accommodations for behavioral health and therapy. This area, this, this is a high performing model and it's something that um, our friends at uh, Veterans Affairs Office, when I've notified, when we've talked about it, um, everybody's quite excited about this because it's going to really step up the access and the availability of, and the efficiency of healthcare delivery. And then speaking of the uh, partnership with the uh, Department of Defense, you, when you were out there speaking with veterans uh, experts, um, you are also speaking with other members within the military to talk about uh, Indo-PACOM, discussing, discussing military land use and growing demands uh, here in Guam. I, we talked about military, uh, the def missile defense agency coming to Guam and what areas they want to use. Uh, and so if you can talk to us uh, about our audience here at PBS, a, li a little bit more about that discussion that was uh, had in mid-May. I think that the Department of Defense and its various agencies and the various forces um, are uh, working and adjusting their strategy based on the evolving uh, events here in the Pacific and this evolving competition, power competition uh, between the United States and China. Uh, and, uh, and looking at all of the various diplomatic um, activity that's happening in the greater Pacific region uh, only further um, brings more challenges to our country, uh, but also um, many opportunities also uh, for the, our country to push back and, um, and respond. In this case, let me first say that, um, you know, the burden of peace in our region um, has uh, fallen on the shoulders of the people of Guam for a long time. Um, we played, obviously, um, this burden included, of course, the wartime occupation um, by our enemy back in World War II, uh, but it also um, was part of the burden um, placed um, with the United States and the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and including all of the Middle East conflicts. Um, and so what, I, what is happening is um, the need for different activities and expanded uh, missions, not even considered a couple years ago, uh, means that um, various uh, elements of the Department of Defense are uh, needing to decide and coordinate um, what portions of their military lands are going to operate on. And the reason why government of Guam is in, interested in this is we, of course, um, have properties that are, um, are um, nearby that are bordering uh, military properties. We have private property owners that also are bordering these military properties. And um, what happened in Hawaii is that the military was um, made to be transparent about its future plans. It had to make decisions on land use uh, and assign uh, and um, disclose the potentialities of the activities. And it allows the state of Hawaii to um, do their part and consider and make decisions about the properties that are impacted by these decisions made by the military. And of course, we don't expect a military land use plan to be divulging strategic things that put our nation in a precarious position. But, um, you know, I mean, the military construction happens through a congressional process. Everything is transparent. And I think that the earlier that we're able to uh, identify uh, and understand what 
the uh, what the desire is from the military to establish various things. Mil uh, you know, we have the land uh, missile defense. Uh, there's some discussions about uh, expanded uh, services that will be operating here and uh, supportive measures for different things. Um, we want to be able to take economic advantage of those decisions. So if there's going to be expanded ship repair capacity in the military side of Apra Harbor, then the Port Authority of Guam and the Guam Economic Development Authority can make decisions uh, to lease properties to private ship repair facilities that may be supportive of those efforts and in the end create local jobs. If they're going to be um, if they're going to be certain kinds of missions that are going to be environmentally challenging to areas that may impact the availability or um, the opportunity for local landowners to develop the properties that they want, then we want to know about that early on so we can mitigate it and we can um, make sure that we have in the big picture a true understanding about the impact. Let me just say, Pauli, that um, I consider myself uh, and the governor, of course, have been very, very uh, frank and transparent with the Department of Defense and our federal partners. And I think this has resulted in a tremendous amount of uh, coordination and cooperation. But the purpose of us doing this is to make sure that the people of Guam and the government of Guam have an opportunity early on to identify what the future challenges and opportunities are going to be. And that gives us the, the proper time to uh, to use our leadership to make sure that the choices are going to be on the best interests of the people of Guam, um, both environmentally and culturally, but also economically. All along, though, in support of the mission of uh, the forever defense of Guam. And I want to say this, it has to be the forever defense of Guam. A lot of folks in our community are, of course, are nervous about the amount of military assets here. We have people in our community that are against militarization, of course, and all the consequences of that. But we're also li living in a, a, a reality where there is a big power competition here. Uh, and as much as we know um, is going to help us make those decisions um, on behalf of our people. Right, uh, and I'm so happy that you explained it. You explained it very well, the military land use plan and what that would mean for Guam. And now I can see the difference between that and a net negative, net negative inventory plan that is already set up where the Secretary of the Navy has to explain to Congress, you know, certain assets, properties, and what they plan on doing with that and continue to report to Congress. So thank you for uh, and explaining. And let me say, Polly, um, you know, with regards to excess lands, right, mm. this will help us determine what truly is going to be excess mm. or what the, uh, and to test what the, the appetite is for um, the federal government to uh, release lands that are no longer going to be in the projected use. It will give us an opportunity to really forecast that um, and also perhaps get some congressional legislation. The last time there has been a significant land transfer um, is based on legislation that Congressman Robert Underwood sponsored when and got enacted when I was his staffer more than 25 years ago. There have been periodic transfers. Uh, we are working with the military on the transfer of Tengisen of the former USO uh, of some uh, water wells um, that um, are needed by Guam Water Works Authority. But, with regard, but for the big picture, um, I think that uh, the, this need and our call for um, this um, master plan or land use plan, which is, which is welcomed by the military. By the way, let me just say this, that um, the military folks know um, that this is a critical thing. And we have, um, we're working with people in Indo-PACOM that have been part of the Hawaii project um, that understand the sensitivities um, that land have in the islands. Um, and I think that the only way to move forward is for everybody to understand um, and to have a very uh, transparent process in order to, to get those answers. But I really do think that this hopefully will open the door for future um, excess land return legislation in the upcoming Congress. Well, thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor, for uh, spending some time here on PBS. I'll, I'll leave you with a, a minute to close with anything that sure. you'd like to say. Um, well, Polly, uh, I'm going, the engagement continues with the Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense. Um, I am going to be in Washington for three days next week. 
uh, meeting with folks in the Pentagon, again, uh, speaking about land, uh, but also uh, folks at the Veterans Affairs Administration continue to uh, uh, to make progress. Um, the governor will, uh, the governor and I have talked about uh, her uh, trying to pick up that engagement uh, sometime in July so that we can continue and push for the progress that we're expecting, especially for the veterans. Thank you once again, Lieutenant Governor, for spending some time. I know you're very, very busy, so appreciate yeah, thank it. You. Once again, that is Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio with us on Buenos Talk. This is Buenos in the Morning.